Senator Berg. Present. Senator Harper Angel. Here. Senator Storm. Here. Senator Westerfield. Here. Senator ba Representative Banta. Here. Representative Raymond. Here. Representative Stevenson. Representative Tate. Here. Representative Beckler. Yes, ma'am. Co-Chair Adams. Here. Chairman Meade. Here. Quorum having been established, we're duly constituted to do business. At this time, I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes. You should have seen those in your packet from October the 12th. There's a motion. Is there a second? Motion is second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. All opposed, nay. Motion carries, and the minutes are adopted. Uh, we will go ahead and move straight into our agenda. We have a pretty full agenda this morning, this afternoon. Uh, go ahead and bring on up uh, VOA. And if you guys want to come to the table and introduce yourselves to the record, you may proceed any time you would like. Jennifer, just there you go. Check see if that is that green light come on. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Now we can hear you. Sorry. We are expanding our reach and our mission to make sure that we are accessible to all Kentuckians who are suffering from substance use disorder, who are engaged in child welfare, and youth who might otherwise be on the school to prison pipeline. So today we're gonna to tell three parts of this story and I'm gonna be joined by a number of colleagues. It's important to VOA and to all of us that do this work that we do this in partnership with others. And so you're gonna see a variety of the partnerships that we have been able to secure over a long period of time. Just as a quick reminder, VOA has been operating in the Commonwealth of Kentucky since 1896. And through that 126 year history, we know that we simply cannot operate in a silo, that we don't have all the answers for all the problems that we're seeking to solve. And so that collaboration is truly at the heart of everything that we do. And I think that you will see that over the course of today's presentation. I start with this slide intentionally because I think it's important that we begin um, today's presentation by keeping the focus on the real outcomes that we are able to accomplish. And this story begins with little Callie Grace. She was born to a mom receiving services at our Freedom House in Louisville on September 5th. Callie was born healthy, free from any substance exposure, uh, weighing six pounds and five ounces. She's continuing to gain weight and do well. She and her mother are stable. They are housed, they're in recovery housing and continuing on their journey. Really, she is why we do what we do at Volunteers of America, because she is an example of the real life-changing and life-saving impact of this mission. I also wanna mention before we go any further that with the 2021 data that the Office for Drug Control Policy released recently, Van Ingram shared that we lost 2,250 Kentuckians to overdose during last year. And that is tragic that is unacceptable, and that is one of the reasons why we've partnered with the General Assembly to ensure that this program is more regionally accessible, and we're gonna share more about that today. I'm joined uh, first by some of my colleagues who are dear partners to us at Volunteers of America. Soon they'll introduce themselves. But now I wanna talk a little bit about the model of Freedom House. Many of you are familiar, but just as a quick recap, this is a program that began in Kentucky in 1993. We were the first provider that recognized that we needed specialized services to treat a specialized population of women who are pregnant or postpartum and substance use disorder. So as we have expanded this model, um, we are now in not only Jefferson County, but in Clay County, Kentucky. We opened our Clay County program right at the start of the pandemic in March of 2020. And that did not cause us to miss a beat. Um, we staffed up, we opened up our program. We have been full every single day since with 
a greater demand than the capacity of beds that we have today. So part of our expansion plan includes doubling the size of our capacity in Clay County. In addition to that, we were fortunate to receive support from you this past session to enable us to go to Stanford, Kentucky, to Owensboro, Kentucky, and to Northern Kentucky. And that's gonna be a really important way for us to ensure that women have closer proximity and access to these services. One of the things that you'll see on this particular slide that is notable is the fact that our organization takes great pride in the fact that we measure real outcomes, not just outputs of the work that we do. So some of those outcomes that are particularly important include the number of healthy deliveries that we're able to accomplish, the number of, um, one of the other metrics that we look at is the, the infants that in their first postnatal visit, they have an increase in their weight gain. Uh, we also look at the fact that we work with many women who are engaged in child welfare. They've had um, their children removed from their custody. And it's our goal while women live with us for us to work on that process of reunification. There is a therapeutic process that must occur before mom resumes that parenting role. And so we do that in a very evidence-based way through parent-child interactional therapy and other supports that take place within um, our program and on our campus. Additionally, we always measure client satisfaction and 98% of the women that we've served say that they have absolutely benefited from our services. Another key metric that we track, and this is something that our friends at Humana and the other plans care about too, are the number of NICU days. In 2021, the average length of stay in a NICU for infants born with neonatal abstinence syndrome was 18 days compared to, in our Louisville-based programs, two days in Clay County or Manchester, five days. And what we see there, and this is really no surprise, a newer program, it's becoming more familiar to the community, but we have many more women coming to us later in their pregnancies or even after they've delivered infants who have been born exposed. So let's talk a little bit more about our planned expansion. You heard me mention that because of your support, we are going to some new markets. And I wanna say that um, you were very supportive of a request. And in fact, I wanna particularly thank Representative Mead and others who saw that we have the capability um, to go into some new markets. And so we took your $8 million investment and we take that very seriously. And we have gone out into various markets and asked for the private sector to match your support. And I'm really so thrilled to tell you today that so far, and we are actively still fundraising, but so far, we have partners at Humana that have pledged $1 million of support towards the expansion. We just announced yesterday, WellCare has made a $1 million investment in our expansion. In addition to that, uh, we have $1 million of investment made by St. Elizabeth Hospital in Northern Kentucky. PNC Bank made a $100,000 commitment. The Hager Educational Fund Foundation in Owensboro has pledged $300,000 of support. And later this month, the Kentucky State Chamber and the Kentucky Sports Radio duo of Matt Jones and Ashley Watts will be with us in Owensboro when we announce their investment of $700,000. I also wanna mention that in Northern Kentucky, some of our key partners include the organization led by Alicia Webb Edgington called Life Learning Center. It's really by Alicia's invitation that first got us to uh, evaluating the market in Northern Kentucky to see where the gaps in services are. And then of course, St. Elizabeth is very eager to have us open a program there. So we've got great partners and we'll continue to talk about those throughout this presentation. One of the things that I'm most proud about at Volunteers of America is that we have been able to take the program design. It's of course an evidence-based model of practice that has been grown and developed over almost now 30 years. And it has been replicated in five other states um, in, um, in the United States. And one of the things that occurred earlier this year that was um, a wonderful visit we had the White House drug czar, Dr. Raul Gupta, who visited Kentucky specifically to see Freedom House, and we were co-hosting him with Senator Mitch McConnell. Um, he had an opportunity to see Freedom House for himself. We've known Dr. Gupta since he worked in the state of West Virginia as the commissioner of the public health department there. And he has been very familiar with our work and wanted to come see it for himself 
because he has pledged as part of his role in the White House to make sure that family-focused recovery is more accessible across the country. One of the things that occurred that day is that we had an opportunity to share a white paper that you'll soon hear about and I think you've now received that was co-authored by Humana Volunteers of America and QV. And you're gonna have an opportunity to learn more about the data available in that paper. In addition to that, um, we were able to share some of the results of a Robert Woods Johnson study that we have conducted to evaluate the linkages of care within our Freedom House network in, in an urban market like Louisville versus a more rural market like Manchester. And Dr. Liza Creel, who is the principal investigator on the Robert Woods Johnson project, she's from the University of Louisville. She was part of a panel discussion with myself and Dr. Gupta and Senator McConnell. Before I turn it over to my friends and colleagues here from Humana, I just wanna make a few remarks regarding our partnership. When I think about um, the importance of having value alignment between our partners, a commitment to doing the right thing for those we serve, even when it's complicated and very difficult, I can think of no better example of this type of partnership than Humana. Humana and VOA have a lot in common. Um, we're both headquartered in Louisville. Um, we care deeply about our neighbors, Kentuckians who are suffering from the complexity of substance use disorder and often mental health issues. And it's really been Humana that's been at our side for a long, long time, but recently accelerated the growth of our expansion, not just here in the Commonwealth, but in other parts of our country. So I'm really delighted today that we're joined uh, by Jeb and Abby. They're gonna introduce themselves and they're gonna take these next few slides. Great, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, very kind words, and I'd like to reflect that as well. I appreciate the partnership we've created uh, with VOA and truly Kentucky-based organizations serving Kentuckians. You know, I, uh, I see a lot of value of not only what we've done historically, but what we can do uh, as a partner moving forward. You know, first, I'd just like to begin by thanking Chairman Adams, uh, Chairman Mead, uh, and members uh, of the committee for the opportunity just to share a little bit about our partnership. Uh, my name is Jeb Duke. I'm the health plan um, leader for Medicaid uh, in Kentucky for Humana. Uh, we serve around 170,000 Kentuckians, but, but importantly, we serve 41,000 Kentuckians who have substance abuse needs or who have a serious mental illness. And our ability to impact those populations uh, is, is really uh, uh, evolved with relationships like we have with VOA. Uh, Humana, uh, since the pandemic began, uh, we've contributed around $40 million to community partners. Uh, and that's to do several things. You know, first it's to expand access, um, but also to do things like research and to meet unmet needs in the community. And that's really where our, our, our partnership with, with the VOA uh, uh, begins. Um, uh, as Jennifer mentioned, we are making a $1 million contribution, but we've um, developed a $1.5 million in funds that have been available to the VOA. And that's to do several different things. You know, first is what we've challenged them to do is to really think about value-based payment, uh, and, and not just with Humana. How can VOA and Freedom House take a step back, think about payment models in Kentucky, work through an industry-level uh, approach to move managed care uh, into a value-based payment model? And what are the mechanism, mechanisms we can judge to determine uh, what are the outcomes we should be measuring and ensuring that Freedom House has the funds available to actually conduct those measurements. So over time, we can show the path to value and we can return value back to those providers who are investing um, in the whole member. So uh, the Freedom House approach really thinks about what are the, all of the needs of, of this patient? You know, what are the needs of the family? What are the social determinants? And what is not only the outcome of the patient, but of the child post-birth? And, and, and that's the way we're developing our value-based payment model. Um, so as of January 23rd with DMS approval, we will be transitioning to, uh, with Freedom House to a value-based model. And we're going to return value in two different ways. First, it's uh, post-discharge. So after that patient has left Freedom House, um, uh, are they staying on that path uh, to recovery? And then secondly, as we look at that child, um, now, are we keep, keeping them and limiting the time of that NICU or preventing that NICU admission? Uh, so we're extremely excited to truly transition to a value-based payment model. Um, but what we're trying to solve is not just the issue with Humana. Uh, specifically, we're trying to move the industry into these types of models. 
um, uh, I have Abby Gilbert with me. She's our population health, uh, one of our leaders in Kentucky. She's done a lot of valuable work over the last year and a half. Uh, she's a member of the VOA board, um, and uh, I'd like her to share uh, uh, her journey and kind of where we are today and what the future looks like with VOA. Thank you, Jeff. Good afternoon, everyone. Abby Gilbert. Um, just a little bit about my background. So um, I actually studied public health, and I've been at Humana for about nine years, primarily um, in our population health, health equity, social determinants of health space. And I have the privilege, um, though I get to spend a lot of time in Kentucky, really taking and learning about great models that we have all over the country in different areas and helping our markets to understand how we can expand um, those services in other places. And so I just wanted to remind everyone that please feel free. I think we're going to take questions at the very end of this, but it is a long, um, we have a long time and many topics. So please feel free as we go through just a few slides um, to stop and ask questions. Um, so first, Jennifer did mention the, the white paper. Um, I think all of you do have that. And just a little bit more information. So Jennifer mentioned the expansion of these programs in other states. And so we really took the time to together um, to develop this white paper that not only has um, information around the great outcomes and the model that VOA does here locally in Kentucky, but also um, policy recommendations um, and a lot of information around some of these innovative payment models that we're gonna be talking about. So um, this paper is not only for uh, use in Kentucky, but we do use this um, in other states where we are working with VOA to expand the um, services. Um, I know Jennifer did touch a little bit on the model, and I think we just wanted to spend a little bit of time helping everyone to understand why we feel there's so much value in the model that VOA, um, that VOA does here in Kentucky. And that really starts with focusing on comprehensive screening to not only address the behavioral health challenges that our members face, but also comprehensive screening for all of the other social needs um, that, that these members face and understanding that we can't truly um, take care of treatment and recovery if we're not looking holistically at all those needs. So VOA does a great job, again, at understanding how we do MAT treatment, behavioral health, um, general overall health of mothers and babies, but also um, uh, counseling, case management, uh, focus on workforce development, outpatient housing. Um, what are the truly the needs? Do these moms need more, more help understanding um, how to take care of their babies, how to get a job? How do we ensure that they are in stable housing and su really successful um, to be on their own post post discharge of these programs. So I think that we'll talk a, lo a little bit more today again about these value-based payments, but I think it's important to just show that there are many things that VOA is doing that is outside of the traditional um, behavioral health treatments that these members are, um, are seeking. So next slide. Um, as Jeb mentioned, we are currently looking at a new payment model that will um, incentivize out, great outcomes. So Jeb did mention a little bit around um, how can we not only pay VOA for the services that they're providing, but incentivize them and pay them for those positive outcomes that they are having. So if baby is born healthy and not spending time in the NICU, then they should be incentivized and rewarded for that um, outcome. It's better for mom. It's better for the providers. It's you know better for us. And also understanding that a lot of the things that they're doing that is helping mom and baby have better outcomes aren't things that are traditionally paid for via Medicaid. So um, diapers or childcare or extra tutoring or whatever emotional support that these women need to be successful, those are not always things that are traditionally paid for. So we can really incentivize the VOA to continue the quality of their program, not just um, what it is that is traditionally reimbursed. So again, rewarding them for um, for that quality outcome versus volume. I think Jeb also mentioned um, it's important for us to look and say six months out, has mom had any additional um, SUD claims? Uh, and also again, six months and at a year. So really saying it's not one thing just to, to graduate from this program, but if we're really helping mom um, ultimately recover and become you know, a, a healthy member of society, then we want to 
um, additionally reward VOA for, for that work um, beyond that. And then again, just understanding that right now, um, this value-based contract that Jeb mentioned is going to be first at the Manchester facility, but hopefully how do we ultimately, again, keep increasing the opportunity for VOA to expand and build more beds and build more homes for these mothers to get healthy, but also help them to have a sustainable payment model that isn't just dependent on additional fundraising or um, you know, additional money that's coming from the state, but really saying there is value that we will unlock when we um, have more of our moms and babies in this particular program. So uh, I will stop for a second. I think is, oh. If it's okay, Senator Berg, we'll let them finish up and then we'll come back to you. Okay. Um, and then last but not least, just to highlight a few things that um, are in the white paper, um, Jennifer mentioned the partner that we have, Quantified Ventures, and the importance of them really helping us and BOA take a step back and say, what again is not just what is reimbursed by Medicaid, but what is the total cost of these programs? And then how do we um, back into that and ultimately align um, how we're paying VOA for these services? Um, again, I think taking all of that, Jennifer mentioned data, we've talked a lot about data and outcomes, but ultimately, um, she will also speak to um, some research that we're doing together, but really saying over time, we have to better measure these outcomes and um, use that to inform how we think about policies and services moving forward, because ultimately, um, you know, I think we believe that outcomes should be rewarded, and I think everyone is aligned um, that that's the best thing for everyone. So I will turn it back over to Jennifer. I want to underscore something that Jeb and Abby just said regarding the fact that the current payment structure really does not incentivize quality. It incentivizes volume. And it's very difficult to treat trauma if we could all agree that for substance use disorder is a brain disease and that often the gateway drug is trauma, it's very difficult to have an evidence-based, trauma-based program when you're serving two and three five, 700 people at a time. Um, our program insists that we have a small cohort of women and families being treated together concurrently so that we can go long and deep with them. And our program design is intentional that we want to stay with mom and baby for the first three years of that infant's life. We know that child maltreatment in Kentucky is most likely to occur in those first three years of life. Plus we know mom's great at greatest risk to return to use occurs in her first three years of recovery. So the design today in terms of the payment modeling does not capture all of our costs. So we are actively fundraising in communities from private sources through grants and other sources of individual support to be able to provide this type of program. And it's really not sustainable as we add additional markets like Owensboro, Stanford, and Northern Kentucky. Um, one of the things that's important, and we're talking, of course, a lot about data, is not just us capturing data ourselves. Um, we have a quality assurance division within our organization at VOA with really smart people who are tracking and measuring everything that we do. But if we're truly going to be accountable to you, I think you might want some external objective input. Um, and we have a lot of that at VOA. I mentioned earlier the Robert Woods Johnson study. Um, that's been very important to us um, to evaluate how these two models are working in an urban and rural setting. Um, I mentioned Dr. Liza Creel with the University of Louisville. She's also joined by Dr. Scott Duncan, who's a neonatologist, um, chief of, of, of neonatology at the University of Louisville, and also serves with Abby on our board of directors. Um, that study is called Strengthening Health Equity and Recovery Outcomes, or SHIRO for short. And we're continuing to take the learnings from that to apply to the model as we expand. Uh, we also have an active uh, grant in Manchester through the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration of our federal government. And with that grant comes the ability to hire an evaluator, and that person is out of the University of Kentucky. Um, we also have two active evaluations going on from the University of Louisville. And we have a partnership with Eastern Kentucky University, and they have an evaluator embedded into our restorative justice program. And we'll be talking about that in just a moment. 
So both Abby and Jeb referred to a total investment of $1.5 million that Humana is making with VOA, $1 million dedicated to our Freedom House expansion. This next um, gift is something that I'm very excited about because I have to tell you that I had a first in my career earlier this year. I had an angel investor come into my world. This is someone who actively reached out to me and said, I want to come see Freedom House and I want to find out how I can invest directly into the mission of Freedom House. And after about a two hour conversation, it became clear to both of us that she saw the value proposition and the business case for us doing this work, but recognizes that we do not get paid to evaluate long-term outcomes. The payment structure ends when mom is discharged. So we're capturing a lot of point-in-time data, NICU days, graduation rates, but as Abby just said, where are moms and babies six and 12 months out? So she said, I will make an $800,000 investment to be able to conduct a social return on investment study, a longitudinal study. And this was actually costing us, as we went and started looking for research partners, $1.3 million over five years. And so Humana stepped up to say, let us fill that gap. And that's what that $500,000 contribution will be used for. So I'm really excited. This is a first. I, I don't know of any other providers and would love to know if there are others that have invited this kind of rigorous research study to really come under the tent with us, evaluate everything that we do, and really tell the story of where these families are two and three and five years out. We have a dynamic duo that we have selected to conduct the evaluation. Um, Dr. Karee Rigg, he is a professor in the Department of Mental Health Law and Policy at the University of South Florida. He spent 15 years of his career studying health outcomes specifically in the substance use disorder space. Um, he is going to be responsible for um, analyzing the data and writing the narrative that goes along with this. We're currently seeking IRB approval because this, we hope, will be in a peer-reviewed journal and will be widely published so that not only will VOA benefit from this, but we are going to be gifting this to other providers across the nation. Um, the other person involved in this study is a gentleman who I met through my relationship with Dr. Gupta at the White House. His name is Jared Kosky. Jared has an interesting background. He proudly served our nation, and when he came out of service, he became the actuarial for the multi-state opioid lawsuit against pharmaceuticals. He analyzed literally billions of claims and helped them identify what the correct repayment model would look like for states across the country. So Dr. Rigg and Jared are going to be responsible for looking at both the economic return on investment as well as the social return on investment. I want to give you an example. Um, and I wish I had a picture, actually, to go along with this. Um, we took a photograph of three of our Freedom House graduates about five years ago. Um, they were um, all gra have graduated Freedom House. They met as clients. They became fast friends. Um, they graduated together. Interestingly, they all had little baby boys right around the same time. All three of them went into our recovery housing. And they lived in transitional housing. And right around the time that their kids turned one, we captured this photograph of the three women and their, their little boys sitting on their laps outside of our transitional housing. Where are they now five years later? Well, two of them work for VOA, and another one of them is um, still sober and living in Lexington. All three of their boys started kindergarten in August, and we're all kindergarten ready. Well, I have to tell you, we've never measured educational outcomes associated with Freedom House, but that alone tells me that we've got to do a better job of not just looking at health outcomes, not just looking at the social return on or the social um, savings, the cost savings and the social return on investment, but also looking at educational outcomes. Um, so we're really excited that this study will also accomplish that. And not just for the babies born at Freedom House, but for those other kids that have an opportunity to come into treatment with their parents. Again, to our knowledge, we're the only provider still in Kentucky that allows mom to bring all of her kids, regardless of their ages. Every other provider, to our knowledge, limits the number or the ages of the kids. And I understand why. It's a 
complicated world and it's a complicated program design when you can have infants up to 17 year olds in your care. Um, but we have made the commitment that we wanna remove that barrier for mom and we're gonna take on the responsibility of offering age appropriate, developmentally appropriate treatment to those kids, which is why this becomes a primary prevention program as well. I think we're ready to take a pause before we transition to the second part. All right, I think we do have some questions. I will start off with Senator Berg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you guys for an amazing presentation. I have, I have a number of questions, but if it's okay, I'm gonna limit it to two. Yep. Um, do you all have any idea of what percentage of the need you're able to meet? Um, we are today meeting very little of the need, and I can't tell you, Senator Berg, a specific percentage um, we have capacity today for about 60 families at a time. Um, we will add some additional 75 to 100 beds through this expansion. And we're not just thinking about treatment in isolation, we're thinking about an entire recovery ecosystem. So all of those other components that bring value, including recovery housing, is part of our plan as we expand. All right, I, I assumed it was a pretty small yes. percentage. I mean. Every step in the right direction is an amazing step in the right direction. Just trying to get an idea of, of what the unmet mm -hmm. needs are going to be. And then um, I was actually rather interested in if somebody could supply me a list of, of what measurements mm -hmm. for value that we're going to be looking at. I mean, obviously, you know, NICU days has already been mentioned. Um, if we're going to look at relapse rates, I, I hope... I hope that's going to be tempered by an understanding of what national relapse rates are Absolutely. because they're still high even with excellent treatment and that doesn't mean it's not worth treating. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to add, and this is just a personal plug on my part, but if you're dealing with, you know, 300 plus families with infants, I hope that you can add a metric there for breastfeeding. Because we know that improves long-term outcomes for babies. And you have a, a captive audience yes. that you can train and you can support and you can encourage. And we know that's a very, very positive move for, yes. for mothers and, and children. Yes. So if you're going to be looking at metrics, I would love it if we could include that. Great, great feedback. And I will tell you that part of our program design includes a nurse practitioner that's embedded in our program. And she's responsible for um, parenting and education. So we do a breastfeeding education and provide lactation support on all of our campuses. So absolutely, that is something that we'll capture in our notes. Thank you. Representative Banna. Thank you, Jennifer. I don't know if you remember, but I was yeah. fortunate enough to tour your <laughs> Louisville site. Yes, and I just have to tell you that you guys do amazing work and I really appreciate what you put on here today. And it was such a wonderful wake up call that Saturday we spent and um, I'm just very impressed. So thank you. Thank you so much, Representative Banta. Are there any further questions or comments before we proceed? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I will say this, that uh, it's interesting to look at the partnerships that you have developed uh, with folks like Humana and other corporate partners, it's something that you don't typically see in these types of programs. Uh, and I think that that speaks to the success rate and the professionalism that you have at VOA. And I think that is uh, to be credited to your hard work and your dedication and those long days of late nights that you put forth to make it a success. The data that you're going to gather is going to do nothing but help us make the most informed decisions on expanding and continuing these programs. And so thank you for what you're doing. Thank you, Chairman Mead. All right, you can proceed with the next part of your program. Excellent. Thank you all. Great job. As we're transitioning, I just want to make one more comment um, based on some of your questions and feedback, and I do appreciate all of that. Um, this study that we will soon launch, um, what's going to be really unique about it, too, is that we're hiring two Freedom House graduates that will be research assistants. And they're going to be embedded in our program and develop relationships with our current clients. So if they, if and when they return to use, it's going to be an easy path back for them. They're not going to get disconnected from us. So it's providing two wonderful career opportunities for two young women. And it's going to make sure, I think, overall, that we're going to create a, a closer linkage to those individuals that have been served. 
All right, so uh, let's see. I apologize. This was on me, Rachel. <laughs> if that's okay. Mayor Watson, you're up. We have one more piece of this first segment. So I got distracted. You? I don't know. <laughs> Please uh, meet my friend, uh, Mayor Tom Watson from Owensboro. So um, Chairman Mead, I appreciate your comments about collaboration and partnerships and from corporate to city government leaders. Um, when we go into new communities, we want it to be community driven, not VOA driven, right? We know some things, we have some evidence-based practices, but it really has to be customized to that unique community. And we want to get integrated into the community. I think the story of Clay County is a great one um, where we've been able to fully integrate. We've added 42 jobs. We're part of that community now and have leaders leading our programs in that community that are local. Similarly, we want to accomplish that in each of these new markets. Um, Owensboro is a beautiful example of what a strong and vibrant advisory council can accomplish. They have been our guides from the very first day. You can look at this list of leaders um, that have joined us, and it's not just leaders on our advisory council, although this is a very impressive list. It includes other supporters like Senator Matt Caslin and Representative Suzanne Miles, who were with us every step of the way as we started to have town hall meetings and really listen and learn from the community about what they had the most urgent needs around and what they wanted to see as we were building this coalition in their community. There's been no one who's been more engaged and supportive than Mayor Tom Watson. We text a lot and we talk a lot. And I have to tell you that not only is he the mayor of Owensboro, sometimes I think he's our real estate agent, our chief development officer. Um, he's constantly flipping me leads, whether it's property that might be available or a new person that we should meet and talk to. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to you now, Mayor Watson. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, uh, appreciate your service. I understand elected official service, and uh, it's sometimes uh, gratitude is uh, something you don't always hear, but I certainly appreciate your service. Uh, several, um, was this last year, I guess, Senator McConnell called me and said, you know, you need to come to Louisville on Saturday morning and listen to this story. So I'm thinking, golf? No, I guess I'll go, go to Louisville, so I'll go. And Jennifer referenced that group we had together, and it was a uh, Really interesting, uh, President Stiber was, was there and and they had that long panel and they started talking about numbers and all those things and it got, got down to this little young lady at the end and and sh her story just captivated me. Um, the trials and tribulations of substance abuse that she was going through and with her pregnancy and the child she couldn't have and finally got herself squared away and got the child back, and, and they hooked me right then because, you know, I, I'm involved in quite a few um, reentry programs, second chance programs, a lot of things in the community because uh, I am about recovery. I think that's, uh, we shouldn't ask them to, to do more if we're going to give up on them, and I don't want to give up on them and, and, uh, because there's, there, there's no sense in that. Uh, and so that young lady's told her story, and I got up from there, and I said, and I got to do this in Owensboro, and so I got hooked up with the chief over here. And next thing I know, we're rolling. And and she talked about the funding for our our uh, um, home in Owensboro. And I'm pledging our opioid settlement money if it ever comes down the pipe at some point in time. And I'm trying to get uh, Davis County Fiscal Court to do the same thing because uh, there's just uh, and these slides are really nice, but until you've been there. Like uh, Representative Bannon, ben, you really can't get the feel of what's going on in that building. It's 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 mesmerizing to me. And back about 52 years ago, I was in a bad accident, and and I ended up being in the hospital about 100 days. And back then, you know, it's like give him all the morphine he can stand and call a family day, you know. So I got addicted to morphine. Um, and I had it every three hours, 24 hours a day for 27 straight days. And uh, back then, the doctor came in about midnight when I was screaming for another shot and said, well, you're not hurting anymore, so we're going to give you any more morphine. And so I took the IV out and 11 days, stay awake, trying to get off it. We hadn't, there wasn't anything else in 1970. So I understand how difficult it is once you get trapped 
in that nightmare of addiction. And so anything we can do in our community, we're more than happy to try and participate in. And we're just blessed that, that VOA is considered having a place in our town. And, and we're going to make it a winner, I promise you. So thank you for having me today. Thank you, Mayor. And now for the transition. <laughs> thank you. All right, welcome back, Rachel. So the theme today, uh, there's probably several, but certainly partnerships and collaboration. Our partnership uh, with the Administrative Office of the Courts is really important to us. Um, they have an abundance of expertise. Um, they have a commitment to second chances. And we have a couple of unique partnerships that we want to talk about with you today. Um, first, I want to talk about the recovery courts. Um, the recovery courts are the um, the approach for women who are engaged in the child welfare system that is very therapeutic and not punitive. Um, I think we all understand the model of drug court. Well, if drug court is the stick approach, uh, the stick approach with services, this is the carrot approach with services. Um, because what we do in family recovery court is we work with moms on a voluntary and dads um, on a voluntary basis who wish to have some additional supports available to them while they're going through the family court process. It can be quite overwhelming. It can be quite daunting. And oftentimes, if they're also dealing with substance use disorder, they have multiple expectations placed on them. So they essentially get a coach, although we don't call that person a coach, but that's essentially what it is, a recovery coach that really accompanies these parents through every step of the process and ensures they understand what's happening. They have access to resources. They're really dealing with their social determinants of health to ensure that they're stable and able to successfully move through the process of reunification um, or to avoid um, any return to use. So our immediate goal is sobriety. The long-term goal is family reunification. Um, we have a partnership with our friends at Seven County Services, the CMHC, in, based in Louisville, um, to provide so services within the Jefferson County Family Recovery Court, which was the first one opened in support from the National Council for Jewish Women that did a court watch program in Jefferson County. Um, they sat for many, many hours within family court and they observed some trends. And often these were families affected by substance use disorder that didn't have that additional layer of support. So they provided the seed capital to begin um, the first family recovery court in Jefferson County. Um, we are an integrated uh, part of that program. We do joint staffing of all of the families, um, given that many of them are also involved in our Freedom House program. Um, one of the graduates of our Freedom House program, who is also a graduate of the Family Recovery Court in Jefferson County, is someone who is going to be that research assistant on that five-year longitudinal study. Um, and she has a wonderful story of how she was able to resume custody and stay clean and sober through the supports offered to her through this partnership. Um, we then were able to open a second family recovery court in Clay County. This is through a Department of Justice grant. One of the things that we take very seriously is anytime we get funding, we go and look to see how we can leverage that with other sources. We write a lot of grants. Um, so we were able to secure a federal grant to open the Clay County project, and that um, happened in 2021. Um, since that time, we've provided services to 34 adults with 65 children. And within six months of entering the program so far, 85% of our participants have achieved family reunification. Um, also this year, um, because of the support offered through um, you and your colleagues, we were able to get state funding to open a family recovery court in Lincoln County. So we'll be working with Judges Venters and Vanover there um, to launch that project. In fact, we're starting right now. We're staffed up. We have space. We're beginning to establish that process of referral. And then we recently received a grant, um, actually AOC received the grant as the applicant to be able to expand into Pulaski and Rockcastle counties to, to finish out that circuit for Judges Vanover and Venters. Um, we're currently exploring expansion in Jackson and Leslie counties, which would round out Judge Harris's um, circuit because he's Clay, Jackson, and Leslie. And then we were recently approached by Judge Blair, we were introduced to her by Rachel Bingham, 
because she's in Hardin County and she's hearing about Family Recovery Court and she's really motivated to bring one there. So we've had a recent meeting with her to talk about what it might take from a funding standpoint um, to begin a partnership there. So um, one of the things that I love, and I'm going to turn it over in just a moment to our key partner on the ground in Clay County, the family court judge, Clint Harris. Um, but one of the things that I love, and actually, Judge Harris, I hope you're watching this. I want to go back to this photograph. Um, you probably wouldn't imagine that that's a judge. He's not wearing his robe. And he's sitting next to one of our participants who is celebrating a special milestone. That's her one year sobriety anniversary. And I love this photograph because it shows that T Judge Harris is really her colleague and her supporter and her cheerleader. They're sitting side by side. He wants her to succeed. And so this project and what is so unique about Family Recovery Court is that the role of the judge really shifts into the role of a cheerleader and a coach and a counselor and a mentor. That relationship is very different than in a traditional setting. And Judge Harris does it so beautifully. So Judge, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Um, we had a recent milestone graduation. We had three of our graduates from your court that were able to um, celebrate um, completion of our program after nearly a year. Are you all there? I'm in Manchester today. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. I am uh, had court this morning. I've got more court coming up. Um, I'd just like to go ahead and, and uh, if the committee has any questions, of course, I'd, I'd be glad to entertain them. But what you see from these slides is, uh, is a really nice looking older man with a bunch of young girls. Uh, <laughs> and I can tell you that if you would have seen these young ladies when they first entered our program, uh, you would not have recognized them that as being the same people who are on the slides. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the last slide right now with, with Ruby and Vic and, and Destiny. Uh, Destiny is a uh, young lady in the striped shirt uh, with uh, between the, the two coordinators and, and the dark hard girl, and she now is an employee of the OA, uh, working uh, as a counselor. She's a certified counselor. She is working on a college degree in uh, social work, and she had been in and out of rehabs, bounced around, and never took it serious. And when she landed at Freedom House, in about about two weeks, uh, she had bought into the program. And uh, she got to have a good long talk with Judge Blair out in Elizabethtown the other day because we happened to be having recovery court when Judge Blair happened to call me. And Destiny happened to be on the thing. And I said, Destiny, tell her about yourself. And when she got done, I said, I said, now, do you think you need recovery court and VOA in Elizabethtown, Judge Blair? And she said, yep, we do. And um but we, the thing that I've learned, and I'm a, I'm a career prosecutor. I was assistant county attorney for 29 years, worked in criminal court and juvenile court. Uh, I'm I'm a, probably the least likely guy to worry about recovery because I was a punishment guy. I, I, I assumed that if you punish somebody enough, they would quit whatever they was doing. Uh, obviously, I was wrong. And what I've learned in this last year and a half working with recovery court is that that these people have a lot deeper issues than you can ever imagine. You don't know their life until you get to know their life. And I can tell you that the young lady standing in front of me in the last slide, she's my daughter's age. Uh, they went to school together. They were buddies. Um, and and when, when she came into court the first day and we asked her about recovery court, she literally took off running out of the courtroom. And, and our team chased her down and convinced her that we really was not trying to do something to her. We were trying to do something for her. She's, she's graduated. She's working at a job. She'd never had a job before she has her child. Uh, and, and she's a mama bear. If you, if you look cross eyed at her child, it would be really, really bad. She's uh she's, she's a great kid. The young lady, uh, next to her, the blonde girl with the striped shirt. She has four kids. One of them's name is Butters. 
And uh, I asked her if she named him after the kid on South Park, but she never did answer that because I don't think she knew what South Park was. But <laughs> she struggled for a long time. Uh, but she, the biggest change we saw in her, Jennifer, and I know I've never told you this, is that she stood up and spoke at, 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 drug, at recovery court graduation. And we never could get her to barely do more than tell us her name. And she came out of her shell. She's, she's looking at employment. She's got four kids. They live by herself. They live in their own housing. They go to school and she handles it all by herself. Um, she came out of a very abusive uh, substance abuse relationship. So we're seeing things here that, that I never really thought we would ever see. I, I, I'll be honest. When Jennifer came two years ago, they started throwing me this routine about what I was going to do. And she'll tell you that my answer was, I don't know what you're trying to do, but I'm willing to try if you're if you're willing to take a chance on us. And and that was all I could say was that I'm willing to try if if you if you'll let us. And and we did, and and we're rocking and rolling down here. Uh, we need more we need more uh, assets to work with. We have a terrible problem with transportation and housing down in this part of the state. The jobs, ironically, we have a factory in London, Kentucky, who brings a bus every morning now and and, and will offer them transportation to work so they can go work. The, 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 the factory is very flexible. If they have recovery court, they, they allow them to be off in order to go to recovery court. Uh, one young lady, uh, she goes to work at nine and gets off at 2.30 so she can be home get her kid off the daycare bus and then she can get him there in the morning. So we've had a lot of participation by the, by the local partners trying to help us, trying to make sure that what we're doing is really going to work. And, um, and I mean, it's really, it, it's picking up. Uh, we're, you know, we, you know, we, we work down here on the old, old uh, logic of we'll fake it till we can make it. And, and we've, We've got we've got a plan and we're doing we're doing good and uh, uh, and I'll hush because Jennifer knows if I get started I don't ever hush I just keep going so I've hushed if anybody's got anything they want to ask I'll be happy to entertain them sometime. We love Judge Harris, as you can see why. Um, he has been right there with us every step of the way. I remember one of our first meetings, Judge, I hope you'll remember this too. Uh, we were talking about just the language and how important language is and really framing things in a more positive, solution-focused way um, rather than a negative or punitive way. And we were talking about how we would hold participants accountable should they not follow through or have a setback. And instead of calling it consequences, we were calling it learning experiences. And I remember Judge going, now, Jennifer, what do you want me to call it? Learning experiences. And I'm like, yes, Judge. And he goes, are you trying to make me a social worker? And I said, well, maybe. And he said, I'll try anything. And so I just love his willingness to partner with us. Um, we've learned a lot from him. Um, he knows these families intimately well. You, you know that he does. You can hear his passion. You can hear his understanding that often this is an intergenerational cycle that we're seeking to disrupt. So we are very active and engaged with participants. We have daily contact with them when they first come into the program. Um, and we will chase you down, literally and figuratively, in a supportive way to say, we want to help you. You don't have to be fearful. If you come in and receive the support, you can do amazing things. Destiny is such a beautiful example. All three of these young women are. Um, and we're just now getting started. The evaluator that's embedded in this project is the same evaluator in the Jefferson County project through the University of Louisville. And that's really important because we want to have high fidelity to this model as it gets replicated. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Rachel Bingham. So special thank you to the co-chairs and to the committee for ha having us. But in particular, special thank you to Jennifer for um, bringing together everybody. I think Representative Mead, it's, a, it's an excellent point. She is very much the joiner of people. Uh, so we are pleased to, to be involved to participate. Judge Harris, if those pictures end up at the Circuit Court College, I'm just saying. They may be free game. <laughs> Uh, to be shared with everybody. Great, definitely great experiences happening um, for you. We, uh, I was asked to kind of give a little bit of a history 
just to be able to give a little bit of background because we did have family what we call drug courts uh, before 2010 and it definitely ages me because we implemented that program across the state when we had the budgetary in in pockets we had four pilots when we had the budgetary crisis those were the programs that actually got dissolved and so the AOC had historically felt like if there was an ability for the structure to be set up where you have the judicial role with a specialized docket and then you have uh, DCBS with their case managers and their, their social workers and then you have treatment in its capacity, then AOC didn't necessarily have to play a case management role, which is what we played. So this particular model that VOA has established has really accomplished what we didn't feel like we were able to do uh, back in 2010 or before that. Uh, it makes a lot more sense. It definitely makes more sense when it comes to not misusing really resources so you don't have that duplication of services you don't have the a whole bunch of people involved in the system so i want to mention that because i think it's important that you know we've moved into sort of a new time a lot of people say why is an aoc still involved because there really isn't you know a, a purposeful defined role there are case managers they are in place and they're being utilized in a much more effective um, efficient way we have um, seen obviously and you all have heard this historically the interest in the increase in the model um, and making sure that it moved from more of a strength-based model uh, than it was more of a punitive and it even though it was not as punitive as potentially the the past drug court models were it still was in function punitive uh, we have had some other jurisdictions that have had models not directly um, in part partnership with VOA, but still within the same strength-based, um, you know, type of model and are still engaged in the conversation overall. In fact, we're all going to sit down in a couple weeks with everybody and say, okay, who functions where in this space? Um, how can we support each other? Where can we build some bridges? Uh, so this map kind of gives to you just a lay of the land across the state. We have eight judges in four jurisdictions that are implementing a family treatment court model. Uh, we've got, uh, what was it, uh, four more jurisdictions um, that are are interested in actually implementing a model we've got three jurisdictions that are now as you guys have just heard receive the funding to be able to get something going uh, when a grant comes across someone's desk everyone starts to share and figure out how we can make those bridges happen and really be able to do that uh, the grant that that Jennifer mentioned the most recent one actually gives the ability to just for AOC to just be a pass-through we're just a pass-through fund that then goes to VOA. Great partnership, a good way to sort of bridge what are some of the pieces that we want to make sure are happening. Another structural piece, just to sort of keep in mind, is that the Supreme Court has been working for the last almost two years on their administrative procedures for specialty courts. And so they have done a lot of work around drug courts um, and just recently released our new administrative procedures. We are now moving into the space of veterans courts, mental health courts, and family treatment courts to be able to have those pieces in place from the courts perspective to say these are basically best practice standards that we feel like you know really support what's happening boots on the ground the judges are involved in that development of those uh, administrative procedures go to the next slide and the final piece we just wanted to touch on, and we have some representatives, uh, Representative Meade, Senator Adams, um, and Senator Westerfield are all a part of our Judicial Commission on Mental Health that has recently been established. Uh, our, our Justice Lambert is taking the lead and chairing that particular commission. We have a lot of work happening in this space, a lot of activity. We've got 72 multidisciplinary representatives that sit on this commission. We have already begun committee work, and out of those committees are multiple multiple work groups that are going to really start to grow and expand. So uh, we're really excited about how the work that VOA is doing is then, you know, able to become a component and a part of our work in, in our partnerships and our collaborations and going to really feed the information around the commission. Uh, and then where else we can all go together and really be able to, uh, you know, do what is intentionally and passionate about all of us, and that's to address substance use disorder, mental health disorders, developmental delays, all the pieces that we are seeing uh, across the court system. The court's goal is, is to more and more move to a system of care approach. Any door you enter, can we do something to be able to give some sort of warm handoff to what your needs are uh, based upon um, the availability of that service of support? Always keeping in mind, you know, our role is around justice and, and how we need to fulfill that, um, that core requirement. So 
I have open for any questions from the court's perspective to anybody. Um, otherwise, turn it back over to Jennifer. Do we have any questions from the members? All right. Well, thank you, Rachel, and really appreciate your cooperation with us throughout the years on this committee. And, and you and Lori both have been very great to work with and always open to helping us in any way. And so we certainly appreciate that. Another way that we partner with Lori and Rachel and AOC is through the delivery of restorative justice services. Um, this is a partnership that goes back now more than 12 or 14 years. Um, it was first started in Jefferson County. Um, Judge Angela Bissick was someone that brought this information into Kentucky and said, we need to provide these more rehabilitative services to youth who are offenders um, because she went and learned about this model and knew that this could reduce crime and this could improve outcomes uh, for both the victim, the offender, and the community. So in 2020, Volunteers of America acquired what was known as Restorative Justice of Louisville. Judge Bissig now sits on our board of directors, um, along with another member of the RJL board at that time, Abby Green, who now also serves VOA's board, and Libby Mills, who had spent her career in the Department of Juvenile Justice, who was the executive director of RJL, came to be part of the VOA team and now leads a division of our organization called VOA Justice. So we've taken that model, we inherited, inherited um, restorative justice as a $200,000 organization. It'll be close to a $3 million organization by the end of this fiscal year. And that's because we took our grant writing engine and other resources to be able to explain the return on investment. So the evaluator that is embedded in this project is actually from Spalding University. They've been tracking recidivism rates. We know that we reduced we reduce recidivism by more than half when compared with kids and youth that do not get, and now young adults that do not get access to these services. Very briefly, the model is this. We meet with the victim, we ensure that the victim is ready to face the person that harmed them, and then we meet with the person who's done the harm, and we make sure that that person is ready to accept full responsibility for what has occurred, and we really pick apart the onion to understand what is at the root you typically don't wake up and look forward to committing crime or harming people. So we look at root cause factors. Because we have an organization that includes behavioral health services and housing, we can really wrap additional supports around these families while the youth is being held accountable. And the accountability looks like this. It's kind of old school mama's justice, where when you harm someone, you face the person that you've harmed, you hear the impact that you've had on them, you take full responsibility, and then together, our trained facilitators, they help those two parties develop a customized plan for what amends looks like. What is the plan of restoration, not just to the person who's been harmed, but to that person's community? Because when one of us experience crime, it reduces all of our sense of safety and well-being. So that youth is held accountable to walking through that plan. And when they complete that plan, the judge is notified, oftentimes, the Charges are dismissed, and they're able to move forward without the stigma and the label of being in the system. So we want to continue to do this model um, throughout the Commonwealth. But to get us started, we're in the middle of a pilot project in Southeast Kentucky. And our research partner is EKU there. We are in eight Southeast Kentucky counties. We're working both in district and circuit courts. We're working in schools. And one of the things that we love about this model is that not only does it reduce crime and it reduces recidivism, it helps victims heal. Because unlike traditional justice, the victim actually gets to sit in the, in the driver's seat, not the passenger seat, to determine what justice means to them. So it's very empowering. It's very therapeutic. We measure um, results on behalf of the victim's perspective, we measure results on behalf of the offender's perspective, and we bring their circles of support to the table as well, representing the community perspective. So I mentioned that um, we have expanded into Southeast Kentucky. We're currently talking um, to a couple of other counties that have approached us, Clark and Madison, about doing this work within their school system. And then I'm delighted to share with the full committee and had an opportunity to share with Senator Westerfield before we got started. We were recently awarded some funding that's enabling us to go into Christian County. So we'll be hiring a restorative justice 
um, resolution, conflict resolution specialist there, um, establishing an office there and beginning this important work in partnership with him and others in the community. And we can't wait to get to do that. We're very excited. What's that? See it? Yes, yes. Every time we talk, Senator Westerfield challenges us to keep moving that direction. And so we're finally going to do that. And like the story in other parts of Kentucky, once we get a stake in the ground, then we use that as leverage to start looking at those other assets that we need to bring into community. So not only are we applying this model within the court system, we're also doing it in partnership with the Department of Juvenile Justice, working with youth that are DJJ involved, and in schools. Um, in Jefferson County, we're working with Superintendent Polio there um, to be fully integrated into seven of the schools. And he's invited us even into elementary schools, because if we're thinking about this from a long game point of view to disrupt that school to prison pipeline, you wanna begin with some of your youngest as they're beginning to maybe have problems with truancy or other behavioral problems in school. We can get in there and teach this model and help resolve problems before they escalate. I recently had an opportunity to meet with the school safety marshal, Ben Wilcox. I'm excited that he's invited us to start providing training to the SRO. So that's an additional way that we can apply this model, giving them an additional tool in their tool belt so that they can use this as a first line of defense when they start seeing those troublesome behaviors begin to emerge. That concludes part two of three. And I'm happy to take any other questions before we move on. I do believe we have a couple. Senator Berg. Thank you. And I don't know if there's an answer to this question, but you know, having just come out of a re-election campaign, how do we explain to people that this is not being soft on crime? I will share with you what Judge Angela Bissig uh, taught me when we first started having this conversation, Senator Berg, because I wanted to make sure from a messaging standpoint, um, I have law enforcement in my family, and they, they immediately heard the words restorative justice, and they had some off-color things to say, but the appropriate thing in this setting was soft on crime. And what I, what I heard from her is that she said, I do not get elected and reelected by being soft on crime. She said, people don't stop me at the grocery store and say, judge, thank you for being compassionate today. She said, but what I know is being tough on crime um, means you're reducing crime. And so this is a very smart approach because we all want a reduction in recidivism. And the data tells the story, 12 years, year over year, we have seen a reduction in reoffenses. So that is a strategic, smart, if not tough approach to crime because we're reducing it and in many cases eliminating it completely. Um, and it's not that the youth are not being held accountable and it's not that in some cases they don't receive a traditional penalty because that certainly happens too. This is not an either or, Oftentimes it's a both and, but we know by having this therapeutic rehabilitative approach where they're, they're really required to face, I mean, that's, there's some intimacy in having to face the person you've harmed, unlike in a traditional approach where you face strangers, right? It's this very sterilized process. This brings humanity into the process for all parties. So that's the best answer I can give you. Thank you for an excellent, um brief way to respond to that because you're right but it's very hard sometimes to convince people that look at the outcomes look at the outcomes yeah so thank you thank you representative tate thank you very much i, I just want to thank you for the program and, and your presentation today you know so frequently we sit into committee meetings and all we hear is the problems mm. and what you're doing is you're actually bringing us a proven solution I don't know if you're familiar with Bridges to Life. And so it's a program for um, people that are incarcerated. And so it was actually introduced in Texas, and it's actually been implemented in seven, 16 states and seven countries. And 66,000 people have gone through this program, and they've been able to demonstrate a 62% reduction in recidivism. So it's very similar to what you're talking about, where the offender meets the victim and actually takes responsibility for their actions, regardless of what has transpired to them prior to them committing them, their crime. 
Because frequently, as you've said, there's a generation of abuse or substance abuse or physical abuse. Regardless of that, they still have to accept responsibility for their own actions. And I love this program and I appreciate what you're doing and bringing this. And I would like to see this moving across the state, not just in one direction, but everywhere. So thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Tate. Thank you. I appreciate that. Are there any further questions? All right. Okay. I'm going to be joined now by my friend and colleague, Mayor Dalton Miller um, from Stanford, Kentucky. So this last segment has to do with a new and innovative partnership that we have developed with the Department of Community-Based Services. And I love this photograph because it shows us in community um, with our partners like Representative Mead, the incoming county judge executive, Woods Adam, and Mayor Miller, as well as Dr. O.J. Aleka, who is working as a consultant for VOA, helping us really develop our market-driven strategy, as well as some of my colleagues and a special person I believe Mayor Miller is going to tell you about in just a moment. But before I tee him up, I want to tell you a little bit more about this partnership with DCBS. So since 1993, I've shared with you, we've been treating women who have substance use disorder and are pregnant and parenting, many of whom are already actively involved with the cabinet before they come to us. And the traditional path um, that they have had to come to us is that they have had a a substantiation of abuse or neglect often resulting from parental addiction. Um, So as we began to think about the number of kids in out-of-home placements, um, and we know that 70% of those placements are driven by substance use disorder. We began to reimagine what this system could look like if we had a different relationship. Instead of just having the cabinet be a referral source to VOA, what happens when we align together as partners and do this work more collaboratively? So um, I, I mentioned that we've had many referrals from the cabinet. Traditionally, the approach has been this. Substance use disorder is identified as a factor regarding the removal of a child. The child gets removed, mom gets referred to treatment, mom rarely goes directly to treatment, right? Because now we've taken from her what is sometimes the last motivating factor that has kept her as functional as she's been able to be. So often her disease accelerates. And then we find her because she has been incarcerated, she's been hospitalized because of overdose, some other bad event has occurred that has endangered her, and that's how we get the referral. So now we get the referral, we get mom into treatment, and now as we stabilize her and get her ready to start imagining again herself as a parent, We're working with a system and often children who are in different counties, and we're charged with going through that process of reunification. Extremely difficult scenario, but that's been the scenario that we've been working with them. And I think DCBS and VOA together recognize, again, there could be a different relationship here. So we have established a partnership called the Family Connections Program, and this is a multi-year pilot project. So we wanna test the theory measure the theory, report back to you the outcomes to determine is this a model that should be taken to scale. In three counties, Clay, Hardin, and Lincoln, we are integrating a VOA therapist with expertise in substance use disorder into that DCBS office. And the goal is to accomplish two things. One, to start educating and changing the mindset of that frontline worker. Now, this is no criticism of any individual or even the system itself. It's actually designed this way where there's a ton of volatility and turnover. So you have a lot of frontline workers who are new, trying to learn this highly complicated, um, very high risk role, where they're trying to assess safety and understand how to effectively intervene with these families. Well, what happens if they have a partner that has all of the experience around substance use disorder that can help start destigmatizing these issues, incentivizing mom to seek treatment immediately. And oftentimes the incentive is that she gets to keep her kids with her. So how do we create a fast pass to get her into a treatment environment like Freedom House? So this person is in that office, again, to provide education and technical assistance and training, but also to co-assess and get mom a referral on demand immediately into treatment, which is another reason as we think about the unmet need to regionalize this model. We've had women in Eastern Kentucky that we didn't have a bed in Clay County. We 
brought them to Jefferson County. That's okay. That is not a great practice, right? We want her in her community as long as that's safe for her so that we can think about long-term housing and education opportunities and workforce opportunities. Um, we don't want to isolate her within a treatment environment where we can't look at all of those other important long-term factors for recovery. Um, this is an integrated model where we do co-staffing of families. We identify together as a team the best interventions, the best plans for them. We'll attend court meetings. Um, it's very coordinated so that mom doesn't have two different plans. Certainly, we don't want two competing plans. We want one integrated plan. We could have no better partner on the ground with us than the person that you saw in that first photograph of this part of this presentation. Um, Mayor Miller has some unique uh, perspectives based on not only his current role, and you heard me say, like with Mayor Watson, it's really important that we're integrated into the city leadership, but he also has a former hat that he has worn as a leader within the DCBS. And so I'm going to turn it over to you now, Mayor. Thank you, Jen. Representative Maygress Committee, thank you for allowing us to be here today. Sorry, I read the sign and still didn't push it. Uh, yep. Yeah. My background's pretty unique. I came from a family that's full of substance abuse. One of nine children that went to, that graduated high school, that got a college degree, went into social work, worked for the cabinet uh, from 96 until 2019. And a lot of success stories, but a lot of heartbreaking stories because when the cabinet does not have the workforce it's ne it needs or the partnerships in a rural county like Lincoln, in a small town like Stanford, in order to meet the needs of our clients. We have to travel to Louisville or we have to travel to Harlan County or Clay County. And we have to see all these people every month. And we try to reunify them with their children. And it, it just can't happen because there's no way for us to take the kids the children to the parents or bring the parents to the children for visitation. So they lose all hope normally. But the young lady that was in the picture never lost hope. She always believed everything that I told her, the young lady on the left, and she always believed everything I told her, that if you do this, I will see that you get your kids back. It was a hard fought battle, but she gave her testimony at a public meeting in Stanford, and she was successful. She wanted to leave. She wanted to leave the program in the middle of the night. And I'm sort of like the judge. When I first started, I was more about the punishment. You done this, you pay for it. And the first time I met her in this situation, because her father actually lives up the road from me, I've knew her for a long time. I walked in and I gave her a notebook and I got fussed at for it, but gave her a notebook and I said, you write your obituary. I said, I'm not dealing with this. I'm not going to your two lovely boys and explaining to them how you died. You're going to do it and you write your obituary. And the next time I come back, I'm going to take it and I hope I never have to use it. She was a success story because she drove herself. She wanted her children back. And she had a supportive family. She had the children's father who was supportive. And something you never see in a case, you're never going to have supportive family and a spouse and a mother-in-law that was willing to care for the children while both parents got help. It is something that's very unique. And I think that's part of why she was successful. Now, what I'm wanting to see with D DCBS and VOA is something that I always wanted. I wanted that expert right there, two doors down that I can go, look, look at this case, what can we do? And by having them in the DCBS office, I think is one of the greatest things ever for DCBS. Because we know DCBS is like police officers. There are far and few that's applying for the jobs because it's a very low reward job at this point. But by doing this, with this partnership, I think we can see high rewards. And I think we can see people wanting to get back into the helping field to be able to pr provide for these families. I personally probably removed uh, over 100 children in my career. 
most of them because of drugs. And I had a, a young lady call City Hall the other day, and she said, are you the mayor that used to be the social worker? And I thought, do I want to answer that question? And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, can I come see you? And this lady brought three beautiful children in with her. And I didn't recognize her because she was three months old when she tested positive for cocaine. And I removed her from her mother. And her mother to this day is still in addiction because at the time we had nothing in place in the March of 1997 to help a parent. It was about protecting the children. That was my job and that's what I was gonna do. And to this day, that mother still struggles with substance abuse, but this young lady has raised, she's raising three beautiful children and has never used drugs in her life. And she came and wanted to know her story, so I had to sit and tell it to her. We hugged and we cried before she left City Hall. But those stories will be more likely to occur with this partnership. And to speak a little more about VOA coming to Stanford, I want to see it grow. We have Casey County that borders us, Boyle County. You've got Judge Petrie with Boyle and Mercer. I guarantee you Judge Petrie will want this program in his courtroom because I know Judge Petrie. I worked with him for years. And I can see Stanford being a hub going out into several, several different judicial districts from there with Judge Moss and Mercer and Jessamine. I can see that happening. And that's what I hope this partnership does with DCBS. And it drives the courts because when they start hearing success stories from Lincoln County DCBS or Clay County DCBS, that they want that in their counties and that we'll be able to expand this. And hopefully the legislature will be able to fund it in order to make this possible to keep these children from being in foster care or the rights being terminated because we all understand how long it takes for some people to get off drugs. It's a long-term process. And I just want to thank y'all for considering this in the future because I'm, I'm just gonna be a success story, I know it. And I wanna go ahead and plant that seed for y'all to be considering this for the future to something that we can fund long-term to make sure that we get these babies reunited with their parents and that we can have success stories in DCBS, which, sometimes are far and few and hard to find represented to me, as you know. So I just want to thank you all for that. Thank you, Mayor. Like Mayor Watson, uh, Mayor Miller wears several hats. He's a great friend of VOA. He referred our very first Stanford employee, and thank you for that. Um, he's helping us staff up. And you know, some of the metrics that we're measuring with the Family Connections Program, we know that there is a cost avoidance when we can um, avoid an unnecessary removal. We also know that it's a family preservation model when we keep that entire family together and move them directly into treatment. Our partnership with DCBS is so important. And when you're trying to change and transform a system, it's really complicated. And so we talk a lot about change management at the leadership levels where we're talking at the highest levels of leadership between our organizations, as well as those frontline workers who really have a lot of influence over the outcome and the trajectory of that particular family's journey. So we're excited to now be launching this partnership. We can't wait to measure it. And I agree with the mayor. I think it's gonna be highly successful so that we can determine how we can take this to scale. So as we wrap up, um, I just wanna have a couple of closing thoughts. Um, you've heard today that we wish to be an excellent provider of care. Um, everything that we do at VOA is around measuring results to, to ensure that we have the most excellent care available. In fact, in about an hour, we're gonna sit down with 70 members of our organization and listen to the Council on Accreditation, which is our accrediting body who have been in our organization for the last three days, seven reviewers, and they're gonna give us the results of our very rigorous accreditation. That's an example where we wanna make sure that we are meeting and exceeding they have literally 1,003 standards that they hold us to. So we're gonna to get to hear those results soon. That's because we wanna be excellent as a provider. But what I hope you also heard today is that we want to affect the systems of care that our clients inter interact with. And that includes the justice system, healthcare and child welfare. And I too wanna to plant that seed with you because I want us to continue to think about creative ways 
where we can leverage what we do best and what we have as far as assets and resources at VOA to get better outcomes. Um, and we can't do that alone. You've seen a lot of our partners here today. You know that we wish to be highly collaborative and lastly, we want to be accountable. We want to be accountable to you. You're investing a lot of resources in us. We want to be accountable to our other investors and donors. We want to be accountable to the people we serve. And that's why we have all of these rigorous studies to make sure that we're not just conducting an activity to feel good, but we're conducting an activity that hopefully makes us feel good because it's getting the right results on behalf of the Commonwealth. So thank you, Chairman and members. I'm happy to take any last questions from you. Do any members have questions? <clears throat> uh, Jennifer, you had you made one comment uh, there in your presentation during recovery court. Did you said in in one area that you helped 34 families? Was that correct? Yes. So we've had this discussion before. You and I talked when you came to me about. Uh, supporting some of these programs i've told you before it, it comes down to really return on investment for me uh and there's a lot of times we get talked into programs here in the general assembly because they're very heartfelt uh, mm -hmm. but they don't have the outcomes that we always want but just looking at that one in particular stat that you gave 34 families the, the cabinet for family health and family services says it's cost of about 55 to sixty thousand dollars per child per year if just on average that family had one child that's 34 children that stayed in the home. That's around $2 million per year. And on average, they're in that care for 24 to 36 months. That's $6 million you saved right there in just one county. And But more importantly, it's 34 families that you held together. So I think this is a great return on investment in your programs. And so we, again, I, I just say I appreciate what you do. And there, there are other programs out there. There are other organizations out there that do similar work, and we appreciate them as well. But uh, we just appreciate all you all do in your heart for the family and the children of this state. And Mayor Miller, thank you for being here today. You were my hometown mayor. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be with you, and it's very seldom do we get the opportunity to chair a meeting where our local officials get to come in and talk. And so appreciate you. Appreciate your heart. You're one of the hardest working mayors I've seen out there water and flowers and helping people personally at their home so we appreciate you as well thank you but uh, i will say that uh, this is the last meeting of this committee uh, for for good actually uh, this committee has been in effect for five years now uh, the general assembly passed a bill that decided to eliminate this committee as a statutory committee uh, but you will probably see this committee come back as a standing committee uh, which will give us uh, more emphasis on these issues and more focus on these issues during the session so uh, we're going to look forward to that and uh, with having said that for five years we've had uh, representative beckler on this committee with us uh, and he came in with me in 2000 we were elected 2012 came in together in 2013 uh, this is his last committee meeting that he'll have with us and and he will be going home to bigger and brighter things and so we want to say that we appreciate you and i know your heart for the children and the families of this state and that's why you came to me and asked me to be on this committee when we passed it so we appreciate you and, and your service to the state thank you very much with that is there a motion to adjourn and a second with that we're adjourned